ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد اعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا ادخلوا في السلم كافه ولا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان انه لكم عدو مبين وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم انما الاعمال بالنيات وانما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته الى الله ورسوله فهجرته الى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته لدنيا يصيبها او امراه ينكحها فهجرته الى ما هاجر اليه respected brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and i'm very glad to be here again today once more in halifax to share some of my thoughts on this topic you have given me to address and just before me the brother who was reciting some poetry in punjabi was beautiful and he was explaining as to why we choose to be ahlul hadith and people very often think that this ahlul hadith jamaat is something new it only emerged in the 19th century after what shay ismail shahid rahmullah did and then sayyid nazir hussain muhaddis dehlavi rahmullah and then nawab siddiq hasan khan these were the the arch apostles of the jamaat of ahlul hadith and this is why we are what we are today but the reality is the call of ahlul hadith is not a new call rather the call is exactly what the sahaba and the tabi'un and their followers were calling to so what was the view of ashab ur rasul their view was that the ultimate source of guidance is the quran which comes from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever the quran directs us to as a source so the quran in a number of places establishes the importance of sunnah without the sunnah there are parts of the quran which cannot be understood for example allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us wa aqimu as-salaa wa atuz zakat pray and give zakat how do we do this and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the the month of ramadan that you must fast in this month in surah baqarah how do we fast in the month of ramadan where are the details what time do we start what time do we finish and what are the rules and regulations with regards to fasting of hajj or all of these things all the details are in hadith so nikah talaq jihad all the practices of islam are explained in the sunnah of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the quran again a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim ma atakum ar rasul fa khudhuhu wa ma nahakum anhu fantahu when the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gives you something take it and when he asks you to abstain from something you leave it now amazingly what we're going to talk about today is directly connected to this issue the status of ahlul bayt number 1 who are the ahlul bayt or ali rasul who are these people and those who claim to love them and those who claim to follow them do they actually love them and follow them these are the things we'll be addressing so every time there is an there's an issue in the house of islam and when people go astray they go astray because they lose they lose the track of the ultimate reality returning to allah and his messenger they start using their own intellects sometimes their emotions ride their actions sometimes you know their bias their prejudice guides them into what they do but the quran and the sunnah goes beyond all of these things the quran and the sunnah regardless of our emotions our thoughts 
our biases, our prejudices, the Quran and the Sunnah has to be followed. So Allah tells us in the Quran again that even if it is against yourselves, you have to be just. In Surah Al Ma'idah, verse five, uh, uh, chapter five, verse eight, Allah tells us to be just, even if it goes against yourselves. And again, in Surah Al Nisa, verse 135, same formula is put there that you have to do justice. And justice is what? Justice is the Quran and the Sunnah. That's justice. This is our view. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to stick to the Sunnah. Hold on tight to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and do not waver, do not be shaken. And there will come times when people will try to push you around. They will try to make you look like that you are the one who is a hater. Because you talk against bid'ah, you condemn shirk, and you simply don't accept all the man-made ideas which have been put into Islam, you are a troublemaker. You make trouble. You are a Wahhabi. To see Wahhabi ho, Gustafi Rasul ho, Ahle Bayt the Dushman ho. These are the things you will hear, right? These are the accusations which will come against you because you simply refuse to reject the narrative. Should I talk in English, Punjabi or Urdu? Which, which language do you all prefer? English. 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 Huh? So what's going to happen to the uncles and... Huh? Okay, inshallah, inshallah. All our elders, you know, if you guarantee that they're not going to kill me outside here, yeah, then it's fine, inshallah. So, the point here is that all of these accusations come your way, just, 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 just as the brother was reciting that poetry before me, is because you love the Messenger of Allah وسلم, so much that you don't want to go away from his Sunnah. You simply want to stick to his Sunnah. And he warned us that there will come a time when people will find holding on to the Sunnah very difficult. It will become so difficult that holding on to sunnah will be like holding on to a burning hot fire coal. You know, burning coal when you take it in your hand, not that you should do it, it will burn your skin. And when you hold on to it, it is almost impossible to hold on to it. Not that, the, that holding on to the sunnah is impossible, but the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is trying to make an example is telling us that there will come a time when you will find holding on to the sunnah very difficult. You will become the strangers, the ghuraba. And then everyone will turn against you. They will demonize you. They will reject you. But be firm, be steadfast. Be steadfast and your reward will be like 50. Allahu Akbar. And they ask, Ya Rasulullah, what 50? He said the 50 of your days, the good ones, they will get the reward of those people. Allahu Akbar. Just think about it. 50 of good ones at the time of the Sahaba and holding on to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah in a, in a day and age where it's been attacked day and night. Imagine the reward. And this is why holding on to the Sunnah today is so important. When we live in a world full of shirk, bida, fasad, zandaka, and all kind of problems. So this is exactly what we are going to be dealing with today. And these problems have escalated to a level now where people are trying to confuse our youth. So now, this is time to put the record straight. And this talk or this lecture is not designed or uh, doesn't, the intention is not to hurt or discriminate against people. The intention is to share our love with the masses out there. We are a people of love. We are a people of mercy. Okay, and we invite everyone to our way with love and compassion. We will simply put our message across. You like it, you take it. You don't like it, don't take it. Simple. Simple. So who are the Ahlul Bayt? And why do we even address this topic? We know at the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Ashabu Rasul were told to follow his Sunnah. Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-Khulafa al-Rashidin al-Mahdi min ba'di. Upon you is my Sunnah 
and the sunnah of my rightly guided successors. And then there's a hadith in Musnad Ahmad which states clearly that rightly guided Khulafa will govern for 30 years. So now we have four people definitely. There is ijma of the ulama on four people that Abu Bakr, Uthman, uh, Umar, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, these four are those rightly guided people. Now up to Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, they governed collectively for 29 and a half years. And the remaining six months, Hassan, the son of Ali, he came to power radiallahu anhu. And after that, it was Muawiyah radiallahu anhu who governed for another 10, 20 years. And then Yazid came to power. So the time finishes at 40 Hijri when Hassan radiallahu anhu passed away. And some ulama say even Hassan was part of those rightly guided Khulafa. Which is not a, alhamdulillah, we accept that wholeheartedly. No problem. So, the Prophet told us to follow their sunnah. Whatever they taught, whatever they agreed upon, and whatever they agreed with, you follow them. Then he told us, خَيْرٌ nasi karni thumma الَّذِينَ yalunahum." ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ yalunahum." The best of people are my people, my generation, and the one that comes after, and the one that comes after. So these are now three generations. خَيْرٌ nasi karni, The best of people. The best of people, O Khairul Quruni Karni, Thumma Ladina Yalunahum, Thumma Ladina Yalunahum, these are the best of people, Ashabur Rasul. Now, what is the definition of a Sahabi now? The definition of a Sahabi is a person who had Suhbah with the Messenger of Allah. Very often people think that someone who saw the Prophet is a Sahabi. No, that's not true. Someone who had Suhbah because some Sahaba, some, uh, some sahaba were blind. Like Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum, he was blind. So, you have to have company with the Prophet ﷺ. Suhbah, have company with him, whether it's short or long, doesn't really matter. And you died in the state of Iman. This is the definition of Sahaba. Ashabur Rasul, those who believed in the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, spent time with him, whether it was 10 minutes or 10 years, and died in the state of Iman. Because even having sahbah with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is such a great privilege that one cannot possibly underestimate it. The nur of the Prophet وسلم, and the blessings of his company, even if it's for 10 seconds, Allahu Akbar. So all of these people were sahaba. So these are the first of the, the best people. Then they follow as tabi'un, those who followed from the Sahaba. Some of them were born not very long after the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some of them were Kibar, some of them were Sigar. Kibar, Hassan Basri, Ibn Sirin, Saeed bin Musayyib, these people. And Sigar who came afterwards, like Saeed bin Jubair and other, like Saeed bin Jubair was one of the biggest Mufassar of the Quran. He took knowledge directly from uh, um, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu. In fact, he was one of the kibar. His status is, is not disputed among any of the ulama that he was one of the best sources of tafsir who, take, who took knowledge from Abdullah bin Abbas and he was one of the masters of tafsir just, uh, just like Al-Kama and Ikrama who also took knowledge from the Sahaba. So, these are the best people and these are the people we follow. And they are the ones who tell us who Ahlul Bayt are. Because they understood the Quran, they took the Quran directly from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi So Allah tells us in the Quran, in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 33, and the verse starts, when we look at the verse 30. <laughs> That any one of you who will do an action of fahisha, an action which is not prescribed in Islam, an evil action, then she will be given double the azab. Why? Because the status of, just like Ashab al-Rasul, just like a man of high status, 
when he commits sin, his punishment is double the sin of a layman, a layperson. Then we go on to the verse 32 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again talking to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu This is what you have to understand this. You have to pay attention. This is very, very important. <laughs> Oh, the wives of the Prophet. Oh, the wives of the Prophet وسلم, That when you talk to people, talk to them not beautifying your voices. Are you paying attention? Don't talk to them beautifying your voices. Rather, talk to them in straight voice. Do not soften your voices. Because in case there is a disease in someone's heart, that person may get ideas. So how does the verse start? Ya Nisa an Nabi. All the wives of the Prophet. Now we move on to verse number 3. Then Allah tells them, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّا And stay inside your homes. This is bad. Now these are the women who are models for us to follow. For our wives and our mothers and our daughters and our sisters. Because the wives of the Prophet are the best models to be followed. As far as our sisters are concerned. Even us, men, we take so many things from them. In fact, 20% of the Hadith literature which is Sahih Authentic comes from a woman, Aisha radiallahu anha. She is one of the Kathiru Rivaya. Uh, Sahabia, and she is the one who narrated so many reports from the Prophet ﷺ. So if you take her contribution out of the, the picture, subhanAllah, it's like losing almost 15 to 20 percent of, percent of Islam and the explanation of the Quran. So this is how important the, uh, the status of these people is. وَأَقِمْنَا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتِينَا الزَّكَاةَ وَأَطِعْنَا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الدِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Now, when you read the verse, all of it, Allah says to these wives of the Prophet. Now how do we know this applies to them? Verse number 32 again, Going back, starts with Ya Nisa an Nabi. All the wives of the Prophet. And the commandments of what Allah is telling them is continuing. And when you know the Arabic grammar, you know here Allah is talking about uh, talking to female. A number of females. So the verse starts in uh, verse 32 Ya Nisa an Nabi. All the wives, all the women of the Prophet Sallallahu kunna In Arabic language, when we have one person, it would be Baituka, for example, for one person. If it's a woman, it's a female, you're talking to Baituki, your house. If it's men Allah talking to, it would be Baitukum, your house. Okay? Or Bayutukum, Collectively, your homes, men, talking to men. When it's biyuti kunna, biyuti, biyuti kunna, or biyuti kunna, this is Allah talking to women, a number of women. And who are these women? Who are these women? The wives of the Prophet. And the verse continues telling them, do not display your ornaments. Wala tabarrajna. Do not show your beauty. Do not display your beauty. Just like tabarrajul jahaliya. Just like the beauty, showing of the beauty in the, day, the days of jahaliya. You know, now you have to observe your manners, the way you conduct yourself, such yourselves in public or in private. Now you are the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is the verse which the Shia, may Allah guide them, May Allah guide them, okay, and may Allah bring them to the right understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. We do not agree with them on these points. And this is not a message of hatred. 
We do not hate anyone. We hate kufr. We hate shirk. But when it comes to people, Allah has commanded us to give da'wah to them. Okay? We do not hate anyone. The, the mere fact that we're doing this lecture is because we love them as humans. And we, we love for them what we love for ourselves. Is that clear? What does Allah tell you in the Quran? Or what does the Prophet Sallallahu tell you in, in a hadith? لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه You will not believe until you will love for your brother what you love for yourselves. Here, لأخيه means universal brotherhood. This is what the ulama have told us. This is not just for Muslims. This is for anyone. Anyone as long as that person is human. Or even jinns. So this is universal brotherhood. Imam al-Nawawi, rahmullah, when he commented upon this uh, hadith, he stated, this brotherhood, li means universal human brotherhood. So when you love something for yourself, the khair of this life and the hereafter, the khair, what do we love for ourselves? What do we love for ourselves? We love the best of this life and the best of the hereafter. What is the best of this life? The best of this life in terms of living in this dunya, Islam number one. Without Islam, there is no peace. You cannot live a happy and a peaceful life without Islam. Is that clear? Okay, and that's the best of this life. So if the believers love Allah and His Messenger for themselves, they have to love Allah and Messenger, His Messenger for others. So here, the purpose here is to clarify the picture so that our brothers in humanity, the Shia community, can understand this and see our point of view. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to the wives of the Prophet. وَقَرْنَا فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّا وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَا تَبَرُّجَ الْجَهْلِيَةِ Do not ornament yourselves just like the woman of Jahliya. And وَأَقِمْنَا الصَّلَاةِ Establish prayer. Again, talking to female, a number of female people Allah is talking to. Yeah, and this is very clear from verse 32 that Allah is talking to the wives of the Prophet. Zakat. It's not Wa'atuz Zakat because Wa'atuz Zakat would be for men. Here Allah is specifically addressing women who are the wives of the Prophet. Allah wa Rasulahu. It's not Wa'ati'u Allah wa Rasulahu because Wa'ati'u would be for men. Okay? Specifically, Allah is singling them out. Now, here this part stops. This is the part now which is controversial, which the Shia brothers in humanity apply to Ahlul Bayt. And their view of Ahlul Bayt is that Ahlul Bayt, when Allah mentions Ahlul Bayt in this verse, Allah means Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein, and that's it. But when you look at the context of the verse in the Quran, yes? Allah is talking to the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is very clear in the verse. So what does Allah say in the next part of the verse? This is verse 33 and it's continuing. Okay. That Allah plans or Allah intends to take ridges away from you, impurity away from you. Allah, why is Allah telling you to do these things? What, does, what did Allah tell them? What, is, what did Allah tell them? Anyone? Anyone? You're not paying attention, are you? What did Allah tell them? What is Allah talking about here? What, is, what went on just before this part? What happened? Saying, telling them what? Yes. And do your salah. And do your zakat. Yes. So Allah is commanding the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, do not show your ornaments. Yes. Do not display your beauty. Do not talk to people softly, lest there is a disease in someone's heart and someone gets wrong ideas. And make your voices very straight. Talk straight. And then Allah. Having said all of that, tells them the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you to do all of this is Because Allah intends to take impurities away from you. Is that clear? Ahlul Bayti. 
وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا So that Allah can purify you with the best of purity. Yes? Is that clear? So this is what the cons, uh, um, uh, context of the verse. Now go to the next, very next verse, verse 34. وَاذْكُرْنَ مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ لَطِيفًا خَبِيرًا Verse 34, again. Then recite in your homes, في بُيُوتِكُنَّ Again, talking to the wives of the Prophet. In your homes, min ayatillahi wal hikmati from the verses of Allah which are being revealed to you. Do it in your homes. In Allah kana latifan khabira and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is subtle and he knows all that takes place. So now when we have seen the context of these verses, three verses, Surah Al Ahzab, Surah number 33, verse 32, 33 and 34. When you read the Quran, these three verses, it is very clear that here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to the wives of the Prophet And if anything, they are definitely 100% without a doubt, with absolute certainty, are the family of the Prophet according to the Quran. Ikrama radiallahu or rahmullah or radiallahu anhu, one of the tabi'i who took Tafsir directly from Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu. And Abdullah bin Abbas is the person whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa took against his chest and squeezed him hard against his chest. And he said, Ya Allah, open this boy's chest to the understanding of the Quran. So specifically, whoever the Prophet prayed for, Allahu Akbar. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said, Ya Rasulullah, my memory is weak. My memory is very weak. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, told him to put your cloth on the floor. And he told him, then gather it. And he gathered it. He said, from this day on, you will never forget anything I say. Oh. And Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, a dawsi who came from Yemen, spent three years of the life of the Prophet وسلم, with him. The last three years, because he came and joined the Prophet when the Battle of Khaybar was taking place. Okay, and the battle of Khaybar took place in the year 7 Hijri and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away in the year 11 Hijri on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal by the way Okay, on the day which some people celebrate his birthday so in reality they are celebrating the death, death day of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not his birthday in fact in India and Pakistan not very long ago this day was called Bara Wafat the day when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died does anyone remember this? Yes, yeah, some, some, some of our elders remember this. Yeah. So there is unanimity among the ulama that the Prophet ﷺ definitely passed away on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. Was he born on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal? No. According to the best reports, or according to the best estimates, the ulama, some of them, they say he was either born on the 9th of Rabi'ul Awwal or the 10th. 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal doesn't make sense. There is no authentic report in this regard. So this is a big problem. So, Abu Huraira came to the Prophet ﷺ and spent little time with him, not more than Umar, Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali and all the rest of the Sahaba. But he has reported more hadith than any other Sahabi. Any other Sahabi, almost over 5,000 reports come from him, authentic by the way. 5,000 reports come from him, over 5,000 reports. Okay, and this was a man who was Blessed by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you will not forget anything from this day on. And he didn't forget any of the reports of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise, Abdullah bin Abbas, he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed for him that, Ya Allah, open this boy's heart to the meaning of the Qur'an. And he was the best Mufassar. To such an extent that when he was a child, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away and he was still a youngster, very young man. And he used to sit with the Sahaba, Kibar Ashabu Rasul. It's like... One of the young, 10 years old, and some of our elders are having a halakha there, and a 10 years old go and the system is right next to them, and they're going to think, okay, this child probably doesn't even understand what we're talking about. And this is what happened. Omar came to see these people, and Abdullah bin Abbas was with him, and they said, this young boy, and he said, what do you think this young boy is? He said, well, he's a young man, you know. So he said, okay, watch this. He said, 
What do you understand from the surah? إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ فَصَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا What do you understand from it? And all of them said yes, it's very simple. Uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's victory comes and people enter into Islam in drives, then praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek his forgiveness. He said yes. And then he asked Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu, what do you think this surah means? He said, this surah is announcing the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu Akbar. And they were all shocked. How did you? He said, just look at... So the meaning he understood of the Quran, others were looking at the very, you know, simple meaning of the Quran, but he went behind and saw what was the real meaning of the Quran in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this surah, Allah is announcing the, the death of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is because of the knowledge which Allah bestowed upon him. Not that other Sahaba didn't have this knowledge. Other Sahaba, like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came on the member one day and he stood, he said, a slave of Allah has been given a choice. He's given a choice that you enjoy the glory of this world. Or you come and join us. And the slave of Allah has chosen the hereafter. And Abu Bakr, the Sahaba were listening to Rasulullah and Abu Bakr started crying. And he started saying, Ya, ya Rasulullah, my mother and my father be sacrificed over you. He started crying. And all of the Sahaba, they said, what's wrong with this old man? Why is he crying? Because they didn't understand what the Prophet was saying. He knew the Prophet وسلم, is telling them that I'm going to die very soon. I'm going to depart. And that's why Abu Bakr started crying and he said, Ya Rasulullah, my mother and my father be sacrificed over you. So, Abdullah bin Abbas has taught Ikrama the tafsir of this ayah. And Ikrama said that, Wallahi, this ayah is about the wives of the Prophet Wasallam. And he used to go in marketplaces, Ibn Kathir rahmullah, in the tafsir of this ayah. He states that Ikrama used to go in marketplaces in, in, in where he used to live and he used to challenge people that anyone who is willing to do Mubahla, Mubahla is invoking the curse of Allah upon you. Anyone who is willing to do Mubahla with me, that this verse was revealed about the wives of the Prophet Wasallam. Anyone who says otherwise, come and do Mubahla with me. Mubahla is you stand in a place and say, whoever is the liar, may Allah's curse be upon such a person, may Allah destroy him. This is how confident they were about the meaning of this verse. And our Shia brothers in humanity, they apply this verse. They cut the context from the top. They cut the context from the bottom. And they take this very part of this verse, which is a very small part. <laughs> they take this part and they stick it on their understanding of Ahlul Bayt. Now, what does Ahlul Bayt mean? Ahlul Bayt comes from two words, Ahl and Bayt. Yes? Ahl means people. For example, Ahlul Amr, people who do work. Okay? Or Ahlul Hikmah, the people of Hikmah. Or Ahlul Hadith. What does that mean? Huh? What does it mean? No, mashallah. What is the meaning of Ahlul Hadith? Huh? Sorry? People of Hadith. Wabiz, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, some people think you say Wahhabi, you know, is not. Well, you know, sometimes if someone calls you Wahhabi, it's not a bad thing. I'm not saying we, we should call ourselves Wahhabi. Allah called us. Muslimun in the Quran, okay. Woman Ahsanu call and Mimman Dail, Allah, who Amila Salihan, Wakala, Innani, Minal Muslimin. That whose word is better than the one who calls to Allah and does righteous deeds and say that I am one of the Muslimin, I'm one of the Allah. So call yourselves Muslims, okay. But when someone asks you what version of Islam do you follow, you tell them we follow. The version of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu and his companions. If you know, call us Wabi or Ahlul Hadith or Salafi. Call us what you like. Call us what you like. But this is what we follow. This is exactly what we mean. And if anything we do, listen carefully. This is the point. 
if anything we do or believe in, this is a challenge to the world. This is a challenge to the world. If anything we do or believe in, which is against the way of the Prophet ﷺ and the collective way of the Sahaba, we will abandon it today. We will abandon it today. Today, I will do it. Bring something to us which does not come from uh, the Messenger of Allah and his Sahaba or their collective actions and belief, we will abandon it today. No problem. This is exactly what our claim is. And we want others to put the same challenge to us. We want others to put the same challenge to us and see what happens. This is where we have to be very sincere with Allah and His Messenger and follow the path which they themselves have sent to us. So Ahl and Bayt are two words. Ahlul Bayt, the people of the house. Now whose house? When you go to the context in this verse, when Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْزَ Ahl al Bayt. Here Allah is talking to the Prophet, right? And his wives. And Buyuti Kunna has already been mentioned. And in the very next verse, again, Buyuti Kunna is mentioned. So which house is being referred to? The house of the Prophet, where his wives live. So definitely, according to this verse, definitely, 100%, there's no doubt that the wives are definitely Ahlul Bayt. According to this verse. Now, according to some reports, some ahadith, others are also included, which we accept wholeheartedly. Ali bin Abi Talib, his family, his wife Fatima, his uh, sons Hassan Hussein, the other daughters of the Prophet wasallam, Zainab, Umm Kulthum and Ruqayya, then the family of Abbas, the family of Akil, the cousin of Ali bin Abi Talib, the family of Jafar, these are all Ahlul Bayt. And these are the people who cannot accept Sadaqah. Now the wives and the family, the immediate family of the Prophet are two different distinct issues here. The wives are definitely Ahlul Bayt according to the Quran. But the wives, some of them, the Prophet ﷺ married and he divorced. So if a wife is divorced, she's no longer Ahlul Bayt. Okay? Because she has been divorced. But there are others who are permanent members of the family of the Prophet ﷺ, right? So these people cannot accept sadaqah just like the Messenger of Allah وسلم, could not accept sadaqah. So there are two categories of Ahlul Bayt. Just keep this in mind. And they are both Ahlul Bayt. Anyone who tries to make a distinction between these people is a liar and is misguided. Okay? Simply doesn't understand what the Quran and the Sunnah stands for. So one category is the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. The other category is his daughters who are from the permanent category because the daughters belong to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ and his uncles, children and their families. But our Shia brothers and sisters, they, what they do is, they divorce everyone else for some strange reason. Only Ali radiallahu anhu and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein. So amazingly, some for some reason, the children of Hassan are not part of Ahlul Bayt. For some reason. And some of the children of Hussein are also not part of Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt to them are only those people who toe their line. Or who they claim are the Ahlul Bayt. For example, now when we go further, for example, Ali bin Abi Talib had 12 sons. Did you know that? Yes? Did you know that? He had 12 sons. Except, you know, um, for example, Muhammad bin Hanafiya. Does anyone know about him? Anyone? Have you heard of him? He was one of the sons of Ali bin Abi Talib, very active at that time, politically and, and religiously. He was very active in the first century. Then Ali bin Abi Talib had a son called Abu Bakr. He had a son called Uthman. He had a son called Umar. Did you know that? Yes? And then Hassan had children called Abu Bakr and Umar. Hussein had son, a son called Uthman. So now when we ask these questions to these people and some of our Shia brothers and sisters in humanity, they 
declare takfir of the Sahaba. They say all the Sahaba are kuffar except few. All the Sahaba are kuffar except few. And they are the names, they give the names, Miqdad ibn Aswad, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, Salman al-Farsi. And there are few more. Except these people, all of them, 99% of the Sahaba are kuffar. Okay, Abu Bakr, Ali, uh, sorry, Uthman and Omar included. So now the point is, if that is the case, and if that was the Aqidah of Ali and Hassan and Hussein, why would you name your children Omar, Uthman and Abu Bakr? So, and it doesn't stop there. According to their belief, Abu Bakr and Omar are the worst of the kuffar on the planet, ever lived. They are worse than shayateen. This can be found clearly in the writings. Okay, again, this is not to spread hatred. This is to break this barrier between us and them so that we can talk to them and explain things to them. Okay, we are not blind to these realities. These realities exist. So purpose is not to spread hatred. This is a, this, the purpose of this talk is to have an academic view on this topic. Okay, this is what the belief is and this is in the books. And if that is the case, why would Abu Bakr or Umar and Uthman be loved by Hassan and Hussein so much that they would name the children after them. Now how many of you would name your children Abu Lahab or Abu Jahl? Hmm? Anyone? Would you name your children uh, Kisra or Fir'aun? Hmm? Would you? Would you name your children with these names? Anyone in, in, in your right mind? Or George Bush? <laughs> huh? Or uh, hmm? anyone else? Tony Blair. Tony. Tony Blair, huh? Tony. May Allah guide him, you know. May Allah guide these people. Amen. I mean, I mean, we don't want anyone to go to Jahannam. Jahannam is not a place to be. So would you name your children after these people? No. Why not? Because Ru'usul Kufr, these are the heads of Kufr. Yes? Likewise, our Shia brothers in humanity, they believe that Abu Bakr and Umar were Ru'usul Kufr. And if this was the Aqidah of Ali, Hassan and Hussein, who forced them to name the children? So they come back with an argument. They say Umar, Uthman, Abu Bakr, these were standard Arabic names. So what's the, what's the problem? They named the children after these names. What's the problem? No, that is not true. That can be argued about Uthman and Umar. That can, that argument can be put forward. But even if that's the case, why would you follow? Why Abu Jahl is an Arabic term? Abu Lahab, Fir'aun is an Arabic, is Arabized version of an Egyptian, an Egyptian word. Why don't you name your children Fir'aun? But even if we accept the argument, Abu Bakr was not an Arabic name known at that time. This was a kunia. And he was called Abu Bakr because he was the father of Bakr. Bakr means virgin. And the only wife the Prophet ﷺ married who was a virgin was Aisha. Is that clear? Yes? And this is why he was called Abu Bakr. So now, what do we do with this issue? So basically, here the problem is that these brothers and sisters in humanity are simply not willing to listen. They need to go back to their sources and check whether this is true or not. If this is true, then what they believe in is not right. These people cannot be kuffar and the worst of kuffar for them to be, uh, you know, for, for, for them to be naming their children after these people. So, with an exception of few, Ahlul Bayt are only the children of uh, Hussein, and then from the children of Hussein, they pick and choose again. Okay, the only child to have survived from Hussein radiallahu anhu, who was uh, a survivor of Karbala, his name was Ali bin Hussein bin Ali. Who was he? Imam Zainul Abideen. Okay, he was known as Zainul Abideen, but his name was Ali bin Hussein. Okay, now he had sons. The elder one was Zaid bin Ali bin Hussein bin Ali. And then there was another one called Muhammad. Who was younger than Zaid? Is that clear? Listen carefully. Are you listening? This is very important. This is history. Okay. Zaid was the son of Ali 
who was also known as Zainul Abideen, who survived in the Battle of Karbala, who was a young boy at the time. And then he got married and he had children. One of his sons was Zaid. Okay? And then was Muhammad, who is also known as Muhammad al-Baqir, who had a son called Jafar. And Jafar had a brother called Ismail. Okay? So now, by the way, from Hussein, the only Ahlul Bayt is um, Zainul Abideen, because he was the only one who survived. From Zainul Abideen, the only part of the family is Muhammad al-Baqir, not Zaid, who was the elder son, and he was the one who, who should have succeeded his father. Right or wrong? Yes? But you know why he was ex excommunicated? from the family of the Prophet he was thrown out, no, you're not the family of the Prophet, we don't want to listen to you. You're not, you have nothing to do with us. So if we look at their criteria, it's very, very inclusive or exclusive, very exclusive. Okay, Ahlul Bayt are the ones we say are Ahlul Bayt, not what Allah and his messengers say or not the standard criteria, because what is Ahlul Bayt? The family of the Prophet, right? And they say family of the Prophet is only Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussain, fine, okay. Wives cannot be the family of the Prophet Even though the Quran is very clear, fine, no problem, okay. But even if that's true, is, is that true? Is that what they believe in? Because when you look at the children of Hassan and Hussain, they don't even accept a lot of them as Ahlul Bayt. So it's a very, very exclusive school with very exclusive uh, criteria to accept who the family of the Prophet is, okay. Because they always claim that we are the lovers of Ahlul Bayt and we are the followers of Ahlul Bayt. You are the followers of usurpers, oppressors, and those who took the, the, the right of Ali by force from him. So they were the Sahaba and they take all these faults in the Sahaba and they talk about the Sahaba and insult them and curse them in their gatherings. It's an open secret now. It's all over the world. You know, before, previously, people couldn't believe this stuff. Oh, how can they do that? But it's on YouTube now. Jazakumullah khairan for YouTube. Okay, They've, it's done many good things as well as many evil things. Okay, but one of the good things you can find on YouTube is the exposure of a lot of the, the Zanadika and a lot of the people of Bida. And you can see the faults very clearly, openly. Some of the speakers are preaching hatred against Sahaba. Okay, but we don't do that. We still invite them with love and compassion. Okay, this is our way. So, the point is that Zaid, who was the son of Zainul Abideen was the elder son. Now the reason why they reject him is because he was on his way to fight against Hisham bin Abdul Malik. Hisham bin Abdul Malik. And Imam Abu Hanifa rahmullah, was alive at the time. And he said, this is the battle of Badr today. Yani Imam Abu Hanifa backed Zaid bin Ali bin Hussein bin Ali against Hisham bin Abdul Malik. And he said, this is the battle of Badr today, Imam Abu Hanifa. And then even later on, when the Umayyads went, the Abbasids came to power, he was still supporting the Ahlul Bayt. That's why he was Ahlul Bayt to Imam Abu Hanifa, was not Ahlul Bayt to the Shia. His Ahlul Bayt was anyone who comes from the family of Hassan and Hussein. Those are Ahlul Bayt. And from the family of Aqil and the family of Abbas. And if the family of Jafar. So, and, you know, inclusive... Um, view of Ahlul Bayt. Now when Zaid was going to fight in a battle against Hisham, some of these people from Kufa who used to curse the Sahaba openly and privately, they came to Zaid and they said, we will join you. And they joined the army. But then they started cursing Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman and all of that. And Zaid said to them that I do not share your view, do not curse those people. They were the best people who ever lived on the planet, some of the best people. So don't curse them. They were the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu So don't join my ranks if you're going to do this. And then they turned around these people and they went away and they left him alone in the battlefield. And he was killed in the battle. Zaid bin Ali bin Hussein bin Ali. Is that clear? Okay, is that clear? He was killed in the battle. And this is why some of these people are called the Rafida. From this, because of this incident. You know, have you, have you come across this word term, Rafida? Yeah, or Rafzi in our language? Yeah, uh, ulama always use this term, yeah? Uh, I don't recommend using this term, you know, because when you call someone Rafzi and start a discussion with them, they are already blocked. They say, oh, this, you, you, you know, you're a hateful person. It's like someone talk, calling us Gustafi Rasul. 
Okay, so it's, it is a derogatory term. Our ulama have used it in the past, no doubt. But if you want to give da'wah to your brothers and sisters in humanity, you know, when you go to a Christian or a Jew giving da'wah to them, you don't say, you kafir, listen to me, just like some of our brothers do. You fuel for the hellfire, listen to me. Wallahi, I've seen people like this, giving da'wah like this. Hmm? What kind of da'wah is this? I've even seen people saying, you know, giving da'wah on a da'wah table with Islamic material. Woman walking past and saying, you are from hellfire. You're going to hell because you're dressed like this. And they use this word as well, which I don't want to use there in the masjid. Come on, man, you're a, you're a Muslim with a long beard, mashallah, wearing sunnah, and you're giving da'wah to people like this. Allahu Akbar, what's wrong with you people? Likewise, we, when we give da'wah to our brothers and sisters in humanity, we have to use the language, even with Qadianis. Don't curse Mirza. My view is, when you talk to them, giving da'wah to them, okay, say yes, we don't believe he was a Muslim. He went away from Islam, you know. And some people sometimes say that he died in the toilet. Yeah? Which is not true, by the way. Just know, just know this. He didn't die in the toilet. Okay, he fell while he was, he, he, this is from his son, you know, this is not, this is not a big, you know, he was suffering from an illness, he had a mubahla with uh, uh, Sheikh Sanaullah Amrasari, one of our elders, uh, one of our predecessors in, 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 subco in the subcontinent, one of the Ahli Hadith scholars, and he challenged him that whoever is a liar between us two, Sanaullah Amrasari or myself, will die from these conditions. Okay, he described the conditions. One of them was diarrhea, I think. Extreme diarrhea, I don't know what the condition was. Uh, Heza, I think Heza is called. Okay, and Alhamdulillah, Sanaullah Masari Rahmullah, he lived for very long. And this guy himself, soon after, a few days after he made this declaration, he died because of diarrhea and he was vomiting. So the, the story is that he relieved, he, he was so weak that he got up from his bed, he relieved himself right next to the bed and then he fell on his face and he died. This is from his son. And this is clearly stated by Sheikh Ihsan al zahir in his book Mirzayat or in Arabic al qadiyaniya Okay? Is that clear? So when you talk to these people, don't curse them and don't, don't insult them. Okay? Use the language which is the language to give da'wah to people. Don't push them away. Bring them close to you. Speak to them with love and compassion. A lot of them will listen. Of course, I know there are people who are stubborn. They don't want to listen. But وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ Upon us to, is to deliver the message. We cannot guide people. إِنَّكَ لَا تَحْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُحْتَدِينَ You cannot guide those whom you love. It is Allah who guides. And this verse came about Abu Talib. And this is another issue. نَمَكَتَا كُلْ جَاگَيَا تَهِ Okay. So, the point is that Zayd, he died in the battle and these people turned around and they left him and they went away and this is why they are called the Rafida, the one who abandons, the one who turns away or turns his back. Okay? Rafida. That's why they were called that. Okay? And there, the title of cursing the Sahaba, the reason why Zayd split with them was this reason. Okay? So now, for this reason, they say Zayd is not from Ahlul Bayt. He's not one of our Imams. Imam Muhammad al-Bakir is our Imam, the younger son of Zayd, uh, sorry, the younger brother of Zayd, the younger brother. So Zayd is out. Now the, the Shia group Zaydiya, they come from this school of Zayd. Okay, the understanding. Zaydiya are very close to Ahl Sunnah. They don't curse the Sahaba and they accept them as the, some of the greatest people. And they believe that Ali was a better choice, but they don't curse the Sahaba. So in that sense, they're very close to um, Ahl Sunnah, but unfortunately in Yemen nowadays they're making a lot of trouble, okay, and a lot of them have joined the Iranian version of Shiaism, unfortunately. But the point here is that Zayd was divorced from Ahlul Bayt. Now, even though he's a direct descendant of Ali bin Abi Talib, he's not from Ahlul Bayt. Then we come to the next son now, Muhammad al Baqir. Rahmullah. And these are I Imams. By the way, there are reports in Bukhari and Muslim from these Imams. Did you know that? from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir and Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. In fact, the best hadith on Hajj in Sahih Muslim, the best hadith on Hajj, it's a long, very extensive hadith in Kitab al-Hajj. It comes from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir. Okay, so these are our Imams and they have been hijacked and things are attributed to them which are not true. 
And this is another topic which I'll come to address in due course, inshallah. Very quickly, let me deal with this issue of Ahlul Bayt. Now, we come to Abu uh, uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. And I'm going to finish very soon, inshallah. Okay? So, bear with me. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, he had, uh, sorry, Imam Muhammad al-Bakr, he had a son called Ismail and Ja'far. Now, he had declared that Ismail will be my successor. And this is one of the biggest problems for our Shia brothers and sisters in humanity. Now, if that is true, then they believe that Imam was speaking from revelation inspiration. The Imams, because if you look at the Hadith, the Hadith goes to the Imam and stops there. That's the Hadith. If you pick up Al-Kafi, O Malla Yahdur al fakih Al-Tahzib Al-Istifar, one of those four books, you will see that an an fulan an fulan an fulan 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 it goes to the imam muhammad al baqala abu abdullah uh, or qala imam jafar and it stops there it doesn't go to the prophet very few reports go to the prophet with our hadith it goes back straight to the prophet an uh, malik an nafi an abdullah bin umar and an qala rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay yes but their reports go to the imam and stops there so they believe the imams had inspiration they spoke from inspiration. Now this is a big problem because Imam Muhammad al-Baqir had declared Ismail to be his successor but Ismail died. And then Jafar uh, was Abu, uh, Imam Muhammad, uh, you know, he was chosen as his successor. Jafar Sadiq, Rahmullah. So even Ismail is now not part of the Ahlul Bayt. He's away. So anyone who disagreed with them, in fact, a large number of the children of Ali bin Abi Talib who came from the descendants of Hussein, they not only reject them, they declare takfir on them because they went towards the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah and they followed that version. And even Imam Muhammad al Baqir and Imam, Abu, Imam Jafar al Sadiq and Imam Musa Kazim and all the others who came after, they attribute teachings to them which they never said. So I would with confidence tell you that 90% of what you find in Al-Kafi, Malla Yahdur Al-Faqi, Al-Istabsar, Al-Tahdeeb is all fabricated and forged. 90%. And even the Imams themselves, according to their own books, they cursed these people who were attributing these reports to them. So when they claim that we are the followers of Ahlul Bayt, a very small excluded part of Ahlul Bayt which they have chosen for themselves we are the followers of these Ahlul Bayt but are they really truly followers of even even though they have wiped out a large number of the family of Ali even if they accept don't accept the wives okay we are not talking about that anymore even when you come to the Aulad the children of Ali and Fatima from Hussein Hassan is gone Hassan's family is out it's not even considered to be Ahlul Bayt. Where are their teachings? What happened to them? What happened to the children of Zaid? Or the children of other children of, of Hussein? From, Zaid, uh, from Zain al-Abideen. They have been wiped out from history, from their history. From their history. They don't exist anymore. But even these people, even if we were to accept the argument that we are the followers of Zain al-Abideen, we are the followers of Muhammad al-Baqir, we are the followers of Ja'far al-Sadiq, we are the followers of Musa Kazim. Is that true? By Allah. This is exactly what Shah Abdul Aziz, rahmullah, he wrote his book for. Tuhfa Itna Ashariya is in Urdu. It's available in Urdu. It's very difficult to find. It's banned in Pakistan. Um, but it can be found. Here, inshallah. <laughs> okay, so if you read the book, you will see that he destroyed, he destroyed the arguments which are put forward by the other side. May Allah guide them. I mean, okay. And one of the points he addressed in the book was the people who narrate from Ahlul Bayt. Now, where does this knowledge come to us from? You know, when we study, when we say, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we say that, right? Yeah, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How do I know? How do I know what the Prophet said? How do I know? This is why we have Isnad, the chain, right? So when we go to Bukhari, we see a chain of narrators. Okay, um, one of the Sahabi narrates from Rasulullah, then Atabi narrates from the Messenger of Allah, then one of his followers, Tabatabi, he narrates from him, and then one of the Imams, and the chain goes back to 
Imam Bukhari. Okay, or from Bukhari back to the Messenger of Allah And in fact, in Bukhari, there are very few reports, very few, with three people in between Bukhari and the Messenger of Allah There are reports like this, by the way. Okay, so they call Tadati, the three narrators' hadith, for example. Okay, so we have a chain, and we can know and see every single individual in the chain, and tell you whether this individual was trustworthy or not. And that's why we are so certain our ulama, the signs of hadith or the books of Rijal, they can tell you which report is uh, weak or which is strong. The weak we don't even consider, we put it aside. Okay, the strong hadith we take. Okay, but with them, first of all, the signs of men or ilmur Rijal was copied directly from the Ahl Sunnah. In the early centuries, it didn't even exist. It didn't exist. So when Ahl Sunnah, they came up with Ilm Rijal, they also copied it. Then they have books like Rijal ul Kashi. A man, he wrote the history of their the men. And that book in itself is enough to wash your hands away from this, this man-made religion. So, there were few men who were narrating from the Imams, for example, who were well known. For example, Hishamain. Hishamain, two Hishams. They were well known. One was called Hisham bin Hakam, the other one was called Hisham bin Salim. Hisham bin Salim. And then there was a man called Zurara bin Ayyan. Okay? These three individuals were directly cursed by the Imams themselves. For example, Muhammad al Bakir, Rahmullah, he was approached by a man and he said that, you know what Zurara is saying about you? And he, he said that you said this, 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 that uh, you made this statement and the Imam fell in sajda, according to their reports by the way, and he said, may Allah curse Al, Al, Al Zurara, may Allah curse these people for attributing lies to me, I never said this. And then Hisham bin Hakam and Hisham bin Salim are known to be mujassama. Some of them actually believe that Allah has a body, fat body, Allah has a head and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hands and arms and legs. Some of these people are mujassama. So a lot of these people had very erroneous ideas, a lot of them were munafikun, at heart they were kuffar and they were pretending to be Muslims and they were forging a hadith on a massive scale and they were attributing to Ahl al-Bayt. So first of all, when our brothers and sisters of humanity, the Shia, when they tell us that they are the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, they need to prove to us that this, is what, this was really actually said by Muhammad al-Bakir or Ja'far al-Sadiq. We will have to go through every single chain and see who these men are. And by the way, when you do that, 90% of the reports won't even be considered. They will be thrown on the wall. They will be thrown on the wall. So how are you the followers of Ahl al-Bayt? They are not. On top of that, another argument we present is from Surah Al-Hud of the Quran, Surah Hud of the Quran, where Ibrahim salam, was given the glad tiding of the birth of Ishaq and Yaqub. Yaqub. You remember that? It's in Surah Hud, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave the glad tidings. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when gave glad tiding, listen carefully now, this is a very important point so that you remember, this has to stick, to, stick in your mind, this is the final point I'm going to make, and then we'll take questions inshallah and we'll finish. Final point, okay, here the story goes that angels came or angel came to give glad tiding of the birth of Yaqub and Ishaq, it's very clear, and then she laughed. And then she laughed 
when the glad tiding was given that you are giving us a glad tiding of the birth of Ishaq and not only that, even Yaqub. How is that going to happen? I'm, you know, I'm barren. I can't give birth to a child and my husband is old. Ibrahim is old. How is that going to happen? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals what qalu. And the angels said, Allah reveals that angels said, That you are doubting or you are, you know, you, you are expressing, uh, you know, astonishment at the Amr of Allah, the Hukum of Allah. Allah can do what He wants, right? Yeah? So even though your husband is old and you are barren, we are telling you that this will happen because Allah has told us this will happen. And you are ast- you're astonished at this. And then they say, Rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May Allah's mercy and His blessings be upon you. Ahl al bayti, inna hu hamidun majid. May Allah's blessings be upon you, O the family of Ibrahim, because He is Allah is hamidun majid. Okay. So now, amazingly, here the angels are talking to Ibrahim and his wife. Listen carefully. Ibrahim and his wife. And they say. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu alaykum ahl al-bayti innahu hamidun majid and when they say ahl al-bayti who are they talking to? Ibrahim and his wife so here even the Shia commentators Qumi and Tabrasi and others like them have clearly stated that in this verse in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the wife of Ibrahim so when we talk to our Shia brothers and sisters in humanity, they say, "Okay, you people are you have no choice. You have to send, you have to send durood upon the Ali Rasul." Okay, so that's why when you do it every single day, you are hypocrites, because in reality, you don't follow Ahlul Bayt. We do, and in your salah, when you do the durood, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, kama sallaita ala Ibrahim. وَعَلَىٰ آلِ Ibrahim إِنَّكَ حَمِيدٌ majid. So what do the ulama tell us here? So which dua do we recite in durood? Where does it come from? The wording comes from this very verse. The wording, the wording comes from this very verse. Here Allah says, in, you know, the angels when they were speaking to the wife, and uh, uh, sorry, the wife of Ibrahim and to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And what did they say? Rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. So, how do we recite this in the Ruh Sharif? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim inna ka midu majid. La mubarak ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama barak ta'ala Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majid. So, you know, when you are sending blessings upon Ibrahim and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so who are we making an example for us? Ya Allah, send your blessings upon Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Ali Muhammad, just like you send blessings upon Ibrahim and Ali Ibrahim. So where were these blessings sent? According to the Quran, this verse, this verse, right? And here, who are the Ahlul Bayt? Who are the Ahlul Bayt? The wife. Everyone, the Sunnis and the Shia, are unanimous on this point. Here, Ahlul Bayt is wife. And when Musa alayhi salam speaks to his wife, or you know, when Allah tells us that he went, Wasara bi ahlihi in the Quran, again, bi ahlihi here is the wife of Musa because there was no one else with them. There were only two people. There were only two people, Musa and his wife. Wasara bi ahlihi here, Musa and his wife. So ahl is very clearly established to be wives, if no one else, definitely wives in the Quran. Okay, and here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that angels sent the rahmah of Allah and his barakah upon Ahlul Bayt of Ibrahim which was his wife. And that is the case in Durood when we say Ali Muhammad, that definitely means the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There are others of course, we don't deny that. According to the ahadith, there are many ahadith, for example there is a hadith, first of all, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam came to his house one day and he said assalamu alaykum ya ahl al-bayt 
And who was in the house at the time? Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha was in the house and she said, Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. She responded. So this hadith is very clear, it's there. Okay, then another hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu was in the house of Umm Salama and Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussain radiallahu anhum ajma'in came and the messenger of Allah put his cloth around them and he said this is my family this is my Ahlul Bayt Ya Allah purify them purify them just quoting the verse and Umm Salama she stated this verse was revealed at that time okay but all of these reports are actually when you look at the chains you will see there are weaknesses in them but we don't deny it because there are many other reports where it is very very clear absolutely crucial and cr- and clear that Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein were definitely part of the family of the Prophet ﷺ. and some others the family of Aqil, the family of Jafar, the family of Abbas all of these were the family of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. so in Durood when we recite Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad here all is definitely the wives and there are others also included whether others are included or not can be debated wives according to the Quran according to the Quran cannot be debated according to the verse of Surah Hud verse 73 and Surah Al-Ahzab verse 32, 33 and 34 this is exactly what the picture is to put it in a nutshell Jazakumullah khairan for listening and being patient wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen and now we have talked about Ahlul Bayt and their reality and their status Jazakumullah khairan